Coming up on Digital Music Trends, episode 202, on the 24th of September 2014, we discuss Beats Music's future as Apple denies rumors of a shutdown, Michelle Fan countersues Ultra Records, Ticketmaster acquires Sherpa.be and EventJoy, the first battle won in the quest to ensure that pre-1972 masters are awarded performance royalties in the US, Splice goes into public beta, the big music project and the music internships conundrum, bands and brands, and much more. This week's show is brought to you by Play MPE, providing secure music distribution and promotional services to the world's largest labels for over 10 years. Play MPE can be accessed on Windows and Mac computers, iOS, Android and BlackBerry mobile devices. Find out more on plaympe.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linali and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and uh, uh, um, Digital Music Trends is available as a video show on YouTube and you can also download the video uh, but if you uh, like to consume the show uh, on, on a desktop for example you can uh, check it out on a variety of different streaming services. Uh, if you like to download it you can get it on the podcast app uh, or on iTunes. Now it's embedded in iOS 8 so if you haven't explored iOS 8 properly yet you can actually go and uh, uh, check out the podcast app and you'll find the digital music trends right there and I'm kind of wondering whether that's going to uh, uh, affect the number of people that subscribe by in, on, on that channel because before of course you had to uh, go and install it separately and uh, uh, this week uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome a couple of fantastic guests uh, back on the show and uh, first of all uh, we have uh, Jim Carroll who writes uh, uh, about uh, music and tech and both uh, on the Irish Times and has a fantastic blog there called On The Record and you'll find the links in the show notes or uh, by visiting irishtimes.com slash blog slash On The Record. So hi Jim and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Thanks very much Andrea. Good to be here. We also have uh, Chandler Coyle on the show uh, who is calling in from Chicago uh, from musicgeekservices.com. So hi Chandler and thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's a pleasure. Uh, and I, thanks for having me back. It's going well here. It's great to have you. And uh, so just remind uh, our... Uh, I, Music Geek Services is a digital marketing agency, or we like to call it a fan experience agency. Uh, works with artists to plan digital uh, campaigns, direct to fan campaigns. But I also do uh, teaching through Berkeley Online, which is Berkeley College of Music's uh, online extension. Awesome. I've been doing that for a couple of years. That's fantastic. And Gemma, on your front, of course, is fairly self-explanatory. Anything uh, that you've been doing that you were particularly excited about in the last few months? Um, well, I've been doing the last couple of months. I've supposed to be taking a break from banter. I do a series of public talks and interviews called Banter. And uh, we just took a break from that for a while because we did 30 yeah, we were doing banter activities in the last couple of weeks. We were actually at Culture Tech in Derry last weekend. Uh, you were there before, Andrea. You were there last year. So we did some banters up there with uh, Jimmy Bing, the publisher of uh, Cangate, John Leyland from the New York Times, Hannah Donovan, uh, the co-founder of This Is My Jam, and also Steve Carson from BBC Northern Ireland. So that went really, really well. So it's kind of, we're, we're back in the banter saddle. And, uh, the, Irish, and the On The Record blog continues to... And so uh, this week we have a couple of service announcements before we start with the news. Uh, so uh, first up, I'd like to thank uh, Play MPE for supporting the show over the past few weeks. Uh, the podcast would have, would have not have been possible without them. So visit plaympe.com to find out more about what they do. And second, I'm going away actually on a proper holiday for a couple of weeks. Uh, and so next week, uh, I've scheduled an amazing pre-recorded show, uh, which is going to be all on music product design. And for the week after, there was going to be an actual break. Uh, and so, uh, yes, that, that is correct. It's, it's break and so if you want to check uh, uh, some of the older shows uh, during that week uh, that'll be fantastic uh, and everything will resume as normal on the week of the 12th of October so you should have a show out on the 16th and uh, 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 I'm sure that while I'm away there's going to be some huge breaking news coming out like the launch of YouTube music or a Spotify IPO but that's just the way these things go so not much I can do about that and uh, this week uh, we're going to start by talking about Apple once again uh, there was a report published by TechCrunch on Monday night that uh, stated that according to several sources at Apple uh, uh, and around the company, uh, the co uh, Apple was going to move towards discontinuing Beats Music uh, uh, and uh, essentially port that into uh, iTunes or essentially move uh, some of the stuff around into, into different services uh, uh, of the company. And uh, the report went on to remark that these statements were substantiated by the fact that there were absolutely no references to Beats Music, Beats music during uh, Apple's recent product keynote and no Beats Music icons were displayed on the new iPhones or 
more on the Apple Watch. Uh, you know, argu- arguably, you know, you could think you could say that it's still very fresh the acquisition, and probably Apple hasn't figured out what is going to happen with that. We've seen more reports uh, afterwards. You know, Apple has denied this by the PR representative, uh, uh, and they said this is not true at all. Uh, they, we have heard other stories afterwards uh, talking about the fact that there would be a relaunch of uh, uh, some sort of music services uh, service in February, so in Q1 or Q2 of next year, uh, which is going to go alongside uh, iTunes or become part of iTunes. And so a lot of question marks on that front. Uh, Chandler, from, from a US perspective, since you you actually have access to Beats Music, uh, uh, do you think that, uh, you know, what would that imply if Apple was to roll Beats Music into iTunes? Uh, it, it's probably for a mainstream uh you know, from a mainstream level, it's probably a good idea. Right. I, I would say iTunes has, you know, a, a much better b- brand recognition. And, you know, from a Beats headphone perspective, there's that too. So it's it's interesting that they would just jettison the name, uh, you know, that that's being talked about, even yeah. though they have the, the Beats brand. But when you think about it, Beats headphones are probably, although it's a big business, it's it's still not, I wouldn't consider it mainstream, at least not across right. all, all demographics. It's definitely a it skews younger or hipper. Um, <laughs> but I use Beats Music. I use Mog. Yeah. I, used, I used Mog on suggestion of people at Topspin, including Ian. Uh, and I, I've used Beats. And Beats, my favorite feature within Beats, and I hope it doesn't go away, is pretty much open the app and it suggests the playlist and, and a, a lazy listening, listening mood. Yeah. You just hit play, and you go about your workout or or your work or whatever. Uh, but he's also in charge. Ian's also in charge of iTunes Radio now. Exactly. Uh, which I've played around with, but just like Pandora, you get bored pretty quickly with with you know radio situation as opposed to Beats. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot, lot of, of stories. Yeah, a lot going of theories. Around. Yeah, it's it's kind of a it's it's a bit of a it's been a confusing couple of days on that front. There's a lot of rumors, of course. There's a, mm. a sources that are unnamed, and and we don't really know what's what's happening on that front. And uh, of course, we also have the fact that there's a couple of other facts to take into account. A, the fact that Apple actually released the Beats Music app on, on the Apple TVs in, in the US, right. which you know kind of would indicate that it would you know. The, the brand wouldn't be retired of course it wouldn't make sense to release a product uh, uh, just before you're going to retire a brand and on the other side you also saw the kind of uh, uh, how excited apple still is about the itunes brand uh, and and how they uh, sort of portray that excitement by doing the partnership with you too that uh, uh, you know was uh, arguably successful but also uh, it created a, a big backlash for the company so jema on your side uh, of course uh, from a, from a territory that doesn't have beats music yet does mm-hmm. apple need to incorporate a streaming service within iTunes to communicate that uh, more easily to customers in Ireland, for example, or in the UK, uh, or should it stick with Beats? I, th- I think basically there's a couple of things here. It's all the nature of the vacuum. So if, if there's no clear news coming out and if PRs are spinning, well, basically we're going to go away and write a story you want to write anyway. Second of all, I, 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 it, it's interesting. As Chandler was talking there about, like, you know, the incorporation of Beats into, into iTunes, I was thinking, like, you've got a situation here where you've got two monsters coming together. You've got the Beats monster, you've got the Apple monster. And you would kind of think, like, okay, who's going who's to take over? I mean, like, look, for example, with Tree Mobile buying, uh, buying Telefonica, the to Tree, 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 Tree are taking their, their, they've got the biggest checks. My hand, like, I mean, it, it's interesting. I mean, Beats has a certain recognition, especially in the headphone space, as Chandler kind of pointed out. But, like, as you just pointed out, when uh, Apple were bringing in U2 and giving them a large wad of cash for a really dodgy album. It was the iTunes kind of brand that was to the fore. So yeah. it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, I mean, I, I personally, I kind of think that, like, I still use iTunes. iTunes, iTunes I mean, despite it being kind of a spreadsheet, it's, it's a great way of keeping music together. I'm still using an iPod Classic. When I was on a holiday, so I, 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 like, did a dog with that. I listen to it nearly every single day. It's a, it's a, they, they, I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a great piece, a piece of kit. And I think basically what needs, what needs to be done, I think iTunes needs a bit of design love, you know. I think it needs a bit of functionality love as well because there's certain things that as different uh, 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 versions have come in they've dropped out certain kind of functionality that needs to be brought back so I mean maybe basically like I mean he, like getting rid of the Beats music thing and bring it into iTunes will give them a chance just to concentrate on that and that alone because otherwise you're going to have, have you've got two vital camps you've got Beats music camp led by Jimmy and Dr. Dr. Dre uh, and then you've got the iTunes camp that doesn't really have a kind of a public champion as such with the same kind of high profile I think Apple needs to kind of like you know whoever is in charge of Apple business development needs to kind of bring the boys together and give them a bit of a kicking and sort it out because it doesn't do anyone any good. I mean, 
you're, you're basically spending money on two separate marketing campaigns with two separate brands. And okay, they've got billions in cash, but like, you know, surely there's a bit of efficiency needed there in the marketplace. If they're going to concentrate on iTunes, well then stick Beats in as iTunes Radio and take it from there. Yeah, exactly. And it kind of uh, what I wrote, you know, what I wrote uh, this week was the fact that Apple also needs to get a shift on in the sense that uh, they can't afford to wait that much longer. I mean, I know that Apple always waits until a market is relatively mature before it gets into it. But uh, arguably, you know, the, the momentum that services like Spotify are, are, are getting is is likely to run over, <laughs> you know, iTunes uh, uh, in in the long term if Apple doesn't do something uh, relatively radical to uh, shift the way the music is consumed uh, by consumers. And so, uh, definitely something that we want to keep an eye on for for the next few months. And uh, uh, also, you know, the other thing to bear in mind is that uh, Beats Music hasn't launched internationally yet, and that's a big issue because, of course, iTunes is a is a huge international brand. And the other question mark would be: Have they got the deals done to launch international and if not how long would it take for them to get those deals done because uh, uh, that's also going to play a big part in in how that rollout happens uh, in terms of announcement and in terms of, of, of you know a wider itunes integration uh, as we've seen with, with itunes radio they rolled out to the u.s first right and then uh, uh, to a few territories after that and and now it's becoming wider and wider so yeah uh, an interesting story then and we'll keep an eye on it of course uh, we don't want to talk too much about apple although jim mm-hmm. i i do want to ask your your thoughts uh, we've talked about this like ad nauseum but uh, uh, what what was the the, the thoughts of of the <laughs> doubling community around the whole uh, u2 saga Oh, well, you see, you said earlier on there that you were going on holidays and you kind of expected basically a Spotify IPO or something like some big story to drop. I was on holidays in Ibiza and uh, they're, they're, like I wasn't checking my phone, wasn't checking my email. Uh, but but the, one day, one day eventually I just picked up my phone to kind of like text someone and I saw two things. One, there was some uh, loads of missed calls from uh, RT, the national broadcaster. I was going, what's that about? And I saw this kind of icon, you, you purchased music. And I was thinking, I've never purchased a tune from iTunes in my life. And there it was, the two albums. That was my, that was my own press list first introduction to the uh, YouTube album. Uh, the, the, the views here in Dublin, I, th- I think basically we're in a situation uh, with YouTube now where they, they've lost the halo. You know, I mean, they, they, the reviews, right, like, aside from kind of like, I suppose, so that there's, there's certain camp followers who always review YouTube albums in a good way. And I think what's, what's, what's basically happening with YouTube now is everything else is overshadowing it. The tax thing is overshadowing it. The whole way they went about putting this album on 500 million iTunes library definitely went against them. And it's also the fact that the album is not very good. You know, I mean, this, this this is really what it comes down to. I mean, in terms of relevance, you two are no longer relevant. And they're also no longer making music which is relevant. They'll be relevant next year in terms of, like, I mean, Billboard and Polestar charts, in terms of, like, high grossing tours and all that. That's fine. That's the business in the things. And that's all good. It'd be good for Guy Zeri's uh, annual year bonus as well at Live Nation. But, like, in terms of kind of like, relevance to pop fans and relevance to music fans, it's, it doesn't, it's not like that anymore. There's a lot of kind of like local media tattle about the fact that the album is based on their life on the north side. But like, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things that you've got to remember that if you two are trying to get back to the way they were back in the late 70s on the north side of Dublin, they were back then, they were a very hungry band. They're very ambitious. They want to get away from this great city. But like, I mean, they're trying to get back there right now and they've got an all star cast in the control room, uh, like, you know, helping them on the way. They didn't have that like back, back, back in the day. And like, you can't go back. You know, you, you, it's, it's really, really hard to go back. And and like, I, I, I just kind of think, like, while I admire them as artists trying to kind of like create these great statements all the time, their track record over the last decade when it comes to those statements is not very good. Yeah. Right, and uh, uh, of course, uh, Chandler, uh, do you have two cents on this? Uh, of course, I don't want to, I don't want to leave you hanging there. If you have well, something that you want to say on on the matter, well, with you two, for me, they sort of became like irrelevant back in '87. So I, I, you know, I saw I saw Joshua Tree. I mean, they were huge in my life. They they were they came across through the screens and influenced bands I was in and influenced record buying and and we could look up to them. And in '87, they were they reached their peak, and after that, they put out good music, but they became sort of caricatures of themselves. So this right. this sort of you know they jumped the shark of caricature ness of themselves, and you know just they got the money, they got the payday. But yeah. I think, I, I think yeah. they missed a big opportunity to. They could have went. They could have given this to their fans first, almost sort of like unexpectedly. Right. Said Apple, we're going to do it, and secretly rolled it out, but. 
Yeah, that's not how crap. YouTube. Roll, yeah, that's not how YouTube roll anymore, Chan. Like, like yeah. the idea of doing something <laughs> totally surprised, like a Bowie or a Beyonce. They can't have to. They they work in committee. Each one of them has got a personal assistant. Each one of those personal assistants has another personal assistant. Each one of those personal assistants <laughs> has an entourage. That's how YouTube roll in 2014, unfortunately. And the idea of YouTube doing a kind of surprise album uh, in the nature you've just described is just it's just not on. It's not on. That's not. They want. They 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 are addicted to the Big Bang, and they're addicted to two things. Actually, they're addicted to the big bang of kind of press publicity and profile. And I'm also addicted, as you just kind of pointed out, Chandler, to the money. I mean, like me, Bono was insisting, we got paid. Great. Like, yeah. are, you going to pay, are you going to pay a tax on that in Ireland or Holland or somewhere else? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's, 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 it's just one of those things. I mean, dude, you're all about the money now. That's fine. But like, you know, stop going on about the music, you know? I think the, sing banker. the single... Well, do, more, do more work with Elevation Partners. I think the worst thing about it was the video that came out of it because it was literally like it was an, an Apple commercial made into a YouTube video and it was like the most bizarre mash of of thing. It was just I just couldn't deal with that at all. Uh, and uh, but moving away from that, because of course we talked about it uh, so much on the show in the last few weeks. Uh, uh, one big story that came out uh, this week was uh, the fact that uh, uh, we talked about this a few weeks ago that uh, Ultra Records uh, sued uh, Michelle Fan, the YouTube star, uh, for the use of a bunch of uh, tracks from the label, especially Cascade tracks uh, on her videos that have been uh, on there for years. And of course, uh, uh, Michelle Fan has monetized those videos extensively and she's uh, uh, made apparently over $5 million last year in revenues, which is amazing for for YouTube star, she's got endorsement deals with uh, makeup brands, and if you don't know who she is, she does a lot of uh, sort of how-tos for makeup videos and uh, other types of uh, sort of non-music content. And uh, uh, so uh, Michelle Fan has now countersued uh, Ultra Records, uh, and uh, uh, in the countersuit, she maintains that she did ask for permission uh, to use Ultra songs back in 2009. And actually, she uh, reports a few conversations that she's had with the uh, new media manager uh, Jason Kilgore at Ultra, uh, who responded by saying, uh, "Really happy that you're su supporting Cascade." Uh, I'm more than happy to let uh, uh, you know her use uh, this content. Uh, uh, there's a bunch of conversations reported around the fact that they actually uh, talked about how they would get around the content ID issue, and uh, at least in one occasion, uh, Ultra has approved uh, when when uh, YouTube flagged the, the use of the track, uh, they actually approved uh, that that user uh, so that the video could stay online. And uh, from from then on, of course, the relationship deteriorated in the last few months, uh, uh, ending up in. Uh, uh, Ultra requesting YouTube to take down the videos involved. Uh, uh, she claims uh, 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 she has actually three different claims. Uh, first of all, that uh, there was an implied consent uh, for the use of the music. Uh, second, that uh, the takedown was issued in bad faith uh, to, to, to YouTube. Uh, and third, that Ultra's bad faith was designed to disrupt her contractual relationship with YouTube in regards to the YouTube partner program. So uh, uh, an interesting case here because uh, we're seeing uh, a label that has obviously had a hand in allowing her to use the music by uh, essentially banking on the publicity. Of course, she was actually adding the iTunes links and the iTunes uh, and, and the names uh, of the, of the uh, track and the artists at the beginning of her, of her videos. And, and the label, of course, was grateful for that because even in uh, 2009, she already had uh, over a million subscribers or, or something along those lines. And, uh, and, and so, you know, how do you see that shaping up as far as uh, uh, how the relationship between uh, YouTube creators uh, that have some traction and uh, labels is going to go forward. Is this representative in any way of what's to come or is it just a one-off case that's not replicable in any way? Uh, Jim, what, what do you reckon? I think we're basically going to see a lot more of these kind of cases. You know, I mean, you're, you're citing there that she has the email correspondence with someone from Ultra. You know, there you go. You know, back then, they obviously were kind of looking at that, kind of going, okay, this is a, this is a, a striking woman who's making these videos. It get a bit of attention. It's grand. It's fine. It's, as we say in Ireland, it's grand. You know, it, it, there's no, no need to worry about that. There's no contracts. You fast forward a couple of years, and this lady is a superstar, and uh, she's making good money from YouTube on the back of this, and the label wants to slice her. And that's, that's all fine and well. It's all all fine and well for labels look for slice wood. But in this case, they already gave the they already kind of like said they already gave this on the nod. You know, there was no there was no contracts labor. They gave it on the nod. And like I think what's gonna happen is labels are gonna be a lot more the two or two things. Labels are gonna be a lot more cautious about this, this kind of thing in the future. Yeah. That's a, like, for obvious obvious reasons. They're gonna think, okay, what's this what's this dude gonna do with my music? You know, is this gonna end up in a situation where they're gonna make loads of money on the back of YouTube and we're not gonna get a slice of this? 
you will also see labels being a bit more forensic about this. You know, they like I me mean, as things stands, like me, a lot of labels are earning very good money at the moment by hiring someone to look for what we call the money down the back of the sofa. You know, the money that they've kind of forgotten about the good times. It could be licensing from Brazil. It could be you know, it could be kind of like I me mean, uh, third party sales from Indonesia, wherever it is. Yeah. They begin they, they begin to look at that. They will now begin to look at YouTube as well, and they begin to look at the kind of like the, the, it, where their music is being used. Can they get a slice of this now retrospectively? So that would be interesting to look at. But then there's also, there's also, you know, I'm an optimist, so there's also there's always an opportunity as well. I mean, like, you know, I like mean, I'm sure you are labels who will look at rising YouTube stars, especially younger ones, especially kind of, you know, teenage kids who are doing those kind of like, uh, you described there, the, the how to put on your makeup or they're doing diaries or whatever. They're like, if I was a, if I was a kind of a, a savvy label, uh, which I no longer am, I no longer ever was, if I was a savvy label, I'd be doing some town scouting on that score. Who are these people? Can we approach them? Can we get them on board? Yeah. Yeah, and Chandler, from your perspective, do you think that uh, you know James Wilde, you know, pointing out the fact that uh, this is something that we might see uh, carrying in the future? And what kind of advice would you give to you know your students on your course or uh, people that you're working with when it comes to uh, placing songs on these kind of mediums that, of course, grant you a huge amount of publicity, but uh, perhaps uh, not much the monetary return un unless there are you know some revenues coming out from from iTunes? Right. Well, in this in the situation, an artist is being asked to do this at the time the artist was in a, a, a weaker position and this was a great opportunity. If they said, well, let's put a contract together, Michelle probably would have said, uh, never mind. Yeah. Um, but here's, here's the thing, you know, who, these, these days you have to remember that if you put something online, it's going to live on for a long time. And so if she records a video with Cascade's music in the background or, you know, as a bumper music or whatever, it's not going away. And if you get, you know, if, if yeah. the label suddenly gets into a stronger position, everything changes. So, but, you know, I, I think it's probably safer to, for the, for Michelle Fan and the other YouTube stars is get it in writing, you know, beyond the, you get something that's, you know, it shouldn't be in perpetuity. Yeah. Uh, you know, like she shouldn't be able to continue to make new videos, but at the same time, once a video is made, that's like, you know, permission to cut a record and use some a sample yeah it's going to live on forever and you can't issue a takedown notice for uh, so talking, going from one lawsuit to another, actually, there was a uh, one uh, bit of news that I wanted to uh, just highlight because it came out uh, yesterday. Essentially, is that uh, uh, the Turtles? It's a Flo and Eddie from the Turtles uh, actually won the uh, case in a California court on the pre-1972 sound recordings. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they, they didn't win it, but at least the judge has uh, delivered. Uh, uh, broadcasters like Sirius XM in this particular case, but also Pandora, uh, it could relate to. Uh, they should have paid uh, the Turtles for uh, pre-1972 sound recordings. Of course, uh, the whole issue, we've talked about it on the show uh, quite a bit with people that actually know what they're talking about, uh, but uh, essentially the whole issue is that uh, um, when the copyright uh, reform happened in 1972, uh, they issued a, a, a master recording uh, performance right uh, that was coming from, they created essentially the copyright on, on master recordings on federal level. Uh, and uh, the the issue is that essentially it didn't uh, from the wording of of uh, of, of the act uh, it didn't exist it wasn't pre uh, predated so essentially anything that was uh, uh, created before 1972 didn't uh, have uh, this this protection and so uh, companies like Sirius XM and Pandora had not paid the rights uh, uh, the um, uh, on, on those master recordings uh, uh, to sound exchange uh, uh, as of yet and so uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how this uh, continues of course that the ruling hasn't been made yet in terms of the actual damages uh, uh, the plaintiffs are seeking 100 million dollars in damages which is a lot and it's going to be interesting to see how that shapes the the the, the future Future of, of this kind of issue in, in the States. Chandler, I guess uh, from your end, you probably heard quite a bit about this. Uh, uh, and do you think yeah, we're going to see a flurry of lawsuits coming off from this? It, it's, it's still, I mean, we don't know what it means. It, right. I, I, saw, I saw some people who know a lot more about this than, than I do say this is only the beginning. Right. You know, this. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, it's, it, it, it felt like to the artist community, it felt like finally someone, you know, gives us a win so they they you know win the battle but the war has just started in this area yeah, so absolutely. Uh, you know it's it's difficult it's unfortunate because you know you hear stories about older musicians struggling and not getting you know Flo and eddie the turtles the, lots of opportunity and it's just 
it's sure that's the law and this is business and you tough luck kid but, <laughs> but you know it just doesn't seem you know when you're trying to pandora is crying and and saying you know trying to negotiate rate things and sirius xm and pandora are benefiting by not paying people who i mean if you cut off pre-72 uh my wife is a huge fan of 60s music as am i i mean that that would be unfortunate if you couldn't stream if they geo-blocked it there was one article was it i think it was the one you linked to about they could just geo-block pre-72 music in california right if yeah. that's what and and just that would be ridiculous yeah <laughs> i mean the, the the thing is that it must be weird it must be kind of difficult on pandora's and serious exams position as well so pandora especially because they are trying to sort of reach out i, I read a piece uh, on the wall street journal for, uh, with a cfo of pandora uh, and they also they made a recent interesting hire from epitaph and they uh, are trying to uh, rebuild some bridges they made a deal with uh, merlin so they're trying to rebuild some bridges with the artist communities that, that, that perhaps were burned right. last week with some of the statements that came out uh, at the same time i guess if you know the company is a business and they're trying to make money for the shareholders if if they felt like the legal requirement of uh, of the act essentially uh, Give them a you know a pass on paying these royalties on pre seventy two, as a business that has shareholders and everything else, it, it, it kind of makes sense that they would be fighting it. But that puts them completely at odds mm -hmm. with the artist community, yeah. and it also sort of showcases uh, something that seems to make no sense at all. You know, the fact that the, for, from an arbitrary date onwards you get get paid, and from an arbitrary date and bef you know right. uh, uh, beforehand you, you don't get paid. So I don't, I don't know, uh, yeah. Jim, uh, from from an outsider's perspective, outside of the US, well, what what do you reckon about this? Well, from my from, like I kind of like the, the one thing he was both he, well, i can't remember which one you said it but you said it's on something i was i stopped my track straight away you're saying that terms are looking for damages of 100 million dollars yeah now right i can i'm trying to i'm wrecking my brain so trying to think my turn songs i know now they're not they're not kind of like i mean they, they, they're they're probably very very big a big 60s band I'm, I'm, I'm not really up on that but i'm just thinking of all the other bands all the other big 60s bands all the other big bands who are caught in this 100 million for the Turtles, multiply that by infinite number of 1960s bands, and it's by Pandora. You know, it's like you, you can see why Pandora want to fight this, because otherwise right. it's going to create this a, a precedent which will cripple them and send them out of business. And then you can be sure that, like, you know, they will, the guns will be turned on other services as well. You know, it's just like, it makes yeah. you see where, where it rolls. This is, this is obviously <laughs> the test case to see what's going to happen from here on in, you know. But, like, you know, the, the, it, 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 again, it goes back to kind of like almost like what, what we were talking about in the last, on the last kind of clip about YouTube and about like like forensic accounting in a way, you know, we're going to see more and more of this when it comes to copyright, when it comes to like, you know, especially when it comes to kind of like the accounting practices done by major labels back in the day, you know, that there, there will be lads who will go in there with the calculators and go through everything and like they just strip it right back down. It'd be like the, the it'd be the biggest kind of like uh, inland revenue or IRS uh, audit of all times. You know, they'll just yeah. go in and go through absolutely everything and find, find the money. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, now it looks like uh, you know, a serious exam here is uh, is in trouble. And but you know, the implication, of course, we we're talking about Pandora because uh, uh, that's probably the company that uh, my listeners are more familiar with. But uh, you know, the implications of Pandora are the same because they are under the same license right. essentially, and uh, they would be violating the same public performance rights if the court establishes that the pre nineteen seventy two recordings uh, uh, you know need to be paid for. And so yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting few months on that, and I'm sure I'll, I'll get some more uh, legal minds on the show to talk about that uh, in the <laughs> next few weeks. Uh, and, Maybe get. Uh, Jason Feinberg on to talk about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know that it's it's always a bit a bumpy road when you first join a company. And you know, yeah. We're moving. Uh, uh, from uh, into a completely different topic, actually, uh, I wanted to talk about Ticketmaster. Uh, this is a story that I actually earmarked the last week, uh, and uh, I didn't manage to talk about because we didn't have time. And so, uh, Live Nation-owned Ticketmaster made two acquisition announcements in uh, in the past couple of weeks. Uh, so, the first uh, first of all, the company acquired the Belgian ticketing company Sherpa.be for an undisclosed sum, and Sherpa has a turnover of 55 million euros per year and about uh, 20 people as staff. Uh, the company will be incorporated in the current Ticketmaster Belgium team, and second, Live Nation. CEO Mike, uh, Michael Rapino announced that the, uh, they acquired the mobile ticketing platform Event Joy, uh, and that was announced at an investors conference in New York about 10 12 days ago. Uh, Event Joy offers a mobile ticketing platform and analytics and social media marketing for do it yourself event organizers, as well as user tools uh, and, uh, and uh, like uh, real time notifications and venue maps on phones. And so, uh, this is a space that Ticketmaster, of course, wants to uh, move into uh, pretty fast, uh, interestingly, because of course they, they are well known for. 
their uh, larger deals and not so much for their support of DIY artists. Uh, but there are other companies that are uh, gaining ground on that front. Uh, Eventbrite being one of them, for example, that they're doing pretty well in the in the small gig space in in, in North America. Uh, and uh, you know, he just remarks essentially that there are no AOL Time Warner deals here, and that these are all small acquisitions. And <laughs> Ticket, Ticketmaster will continue to do uh, these acquisitions uh, going forward. So, uh, uh, Jim, you know. Well, what you reckon about Ticketmaster continuing, uh, you know, to, to buy uh, third-party ticketing companies, mm. even as it is uh, already a monster uh, <laughs> mm. uh, of, of a company? And and uh, uh, how do you see them moving into this DIY space, given the incredible fees that they charge to our two for for tickets these, these days? Well, it's like it's like it's like the ultimate game of pack and when it goes to Ticketmaster and Live Nation, it's just gobble up everything in sight. This is the business model, this is how they operate. So I mean they're looking at like you talked there about kind of DIY spaces and the small gig spaces. They're still selling tickets, and you gotta remember this. And like that's what Live Nation want a kind of a cut of that. They want a share of that. You know, and th- th- this is how they th- this is how th- this is the model that like I mean Live Nation have been putting in place since SFX and Clear Channel days. Buy, 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 expand, create everything, own the whole space, own every part of the space. And like it's interesting that like you know we we're finally seeing, and uh, we're finally seeing some competition on the live music side. You know, we're finally right. seeing uh, like people moving. For uh, up to now, the tech space has always been looking at the records, chipping away at the records, hitting the records, going to the records all the time. And the last while, we've seen various kind of like companies identify weak spots in the live music sector and go for that. And ticketing is definitely one of those. Everyone hates Ticketmaster. Absolutely, <laughs> everyone hates Ticketmaster. You know, my mother was buying tickets for a a a, a show down in Limerick, and she did. Ticketmaster around the box. She now hates Ticketmaster as well, and she's never hated anyone in her life. So, like anyone who has to engage them doesn't like them. So, like you know, you're kind of going like, well, if you don't, if you don't like me, we're going to be as big as possible, so you can't ignore us anymore. So yeah. they will, they will. Like, I mean, I think Eventbrite's amazing. We use Eventbrite for banter, and it's, 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 it's a great, great service. If they move to Ticketmaster, what we do, you know, what we do, we wouldn't use Ticketmaster because I mean, as you just said, fees are too high. Like we, we go off, we do something else. I mean, people involved with banter. There's a company called Bobby Tonic. They've, they're involved in Till Tonic and Door Tonic, which are kind of like those kind of services. There's a company that uh, HQ Open Dome called Gig Starter, and they're also involved in this space. There's loads of companies moving into this space. I take it back to obviously kind of going like, okay, you know, these companies are only going to own maybe five, maybe eight percent of the market at total, but still five, eight percent of the market they're not getting, you know. And like you, know, it's like I can see why Ticketmaster works for the big promoters and, and the big and the big band. I mean, they get one, they get one daily a day. Everything is on that. Or they're just dealing with one check, as we, as we know from kind of like uh, from various court cases and the like that Ticketmaster like to give out rebates to favorite promoters and give advances out left, right and center. So like, it's a good position to be in. But I think Ticketmaster's model is definitely, is yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, we, we can't really uh, uh, say that Ticketmaster are the only ones to do it. Uh, Eventim, which is a huge uh, German company, do the same thing in terms of charges and fees. And so, uh, yeah. you know, a, a lot of the bigger players uh, play that game of. of uh, uh, well, it, the important thing to point out, Andrea, is that, like, I mean, worldwide, Ticketmaster are the whipping boy for all this. They, they are, they, they're taking the brunt of all this. Yes, there are other companies involved in it. And you kind of, I, I know, say, here in the Irish space, we've got something about tickets, and it's like their line is, well, we're not Ticketmaster, but you're still, they're still charging. <laughs> and all that, but Ticketmaster right. are the whipping boys for all this, and they're taking the brunt of it. And they're the ones as well. Like in fairness to them as well, they like I mean, like they're, they're the ones that the artists are blaming as well. They're, they're taking, they're taking, they're taking all the be- all the beatings on behalf of the artists. Uh, Chandler, <laughs> so Chandler, so t- Ticketmaster equals uh, uh, Comcast in the ticketing space. Uh, you, you sort of uh, everybody hates it, but but nobody can actually yeah. do without it. I mean, it's it's been twenty years. When did Pearl Jam? have their issues with them i mean it's been over 20 years we've been hating them but you know that you can't fight city hall you know they're there you know it's uh i used to see like what i've noticed over the last couple years is i would get sent a list of tour dates where i'd have to do something for ticketing for an artist and there'd be 30 dates and it would be ticketmaster 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 now you're seeing all different kinds of ticket agencies you know so it's 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 their competition is growing, but it's it so it's interesting. I you know Ticketmaster is just a, a necessary evil, and the ticket fees sometimes are ridiculous, and yeah. especially as ticket prices rise, so do the fees if they're a percentage based. Uh, but you just pay them. Yeah. Uh, I you know even the smaller services, their fees are sometimes ridiculous. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> we can't live. I still remember the days of having to go to the the you know the Ticketron the mall right and and hope that there wasn't somebody at the other 
ticket printing place getting the seats you wanted. So yeah. this is much easier. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just recalling as well how I used to go to, we had a record store in my town in Italy and, and he was also acted as, as a ticket seller. So you'd, if you yeah. wanted tickets to a gig in Milan, you'd have to go to him and say, oh, get me two tickets. Arcade thing, way of doing it pre-internet. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 much, it's, much, it's much easier. I used to work with a promoter in Dublin who promoted dead metal gigs in Dublin. And how he promoted dead metal gigs was really, really simple. You just take a tiny little card and you place it on the wall of one record shop, or one record shop only in town, uh, saying, I don't know what band were coming, dead metal superstars, whatever they were called, are playing McGonagall's. And you leave all the tickets there and you'd sell them in a day. You know? So right. like, you, you, you knew where the audience was. You just went, you just went straight to them. Right. Yep. Exactly. And it's, it's a very different way of doing things today, of course. Uh, and uh, but one thing I wanted to mention was the fact that Who Sampled released uh, an Android app. So if you are an Android user and you like knowing uh, who sampled who, uh, then you might want to go and get Who Sampled on the Android. Uh, it's free, uh, actually. So it's a different business model than the iOS version, which is uh, £1.99 or $2.99. Uh, this is ad-based, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, making uh, possibly uh, uh, good use of, of the larger real estate of, of most Android devices or this, although this might change with the new iOS devices if they don't, don't, don't bend too much. And uh, so Who Sampled, yeah, uh, go and check it out on uh, whosampled.com or go and find it on the Android store. It looks like a cool app. And uh, actually, I've got an interview with the CEO on the DMT one-to-one -one show that's also coming out alongside this show. Uh, uh, so if you are not subscribing to that, you can check out the DMT one-to-one -one on the podcast app and you'll find that there as well. And uh, let's talk about another startup called Splice. So Splice is a new uh, startup uh, uh, they've been in, in a closed beta for about uh, 10 months uh, and now they have uh, finally opened up uh, to uh, their beta to everyone. Uh, so uh, I interviewed the company in Miami back in March uh, and uh, uh, they were probably uh, three or four months into the uh, private beta and essentially what they do is that they allow musicians to synchronize their project data to the cloud on an ongoing basis uh, so that it can be shared with others uh, and used for collaborations. So uh, they started out by supporting Ableton but also uh, they support uh, Logic uh, and the FL Studio studio right now and uh, the interesting thing uh, here is that it's not just a, a tool for musicians to consume music uh, and to find out how other people have uh, created that piece of music it's also an interesting new technology when it comes to the visualization uh, visualization of it and we've seen over the years a bunch of different apps that allowed you to uh, take stems and, and play with them and do different things but uh, what they do is that the project itself now is going to be uh, uh, visually available to people that want to play it uh, uh, if you want to share it of course uh, with, the, with the world and uh, uh, people are going to be able to see essentially a grid a grid system of all the different stems and instruments that you have on the track and they're going to be able to uh, mute them uh, play them individually uh, do different things with them and sort of understand how the song is constructed that way it looks very much like almost like a soundcloud uh, uh, widget uh, as far as the simplified waveform is concerned uh, and 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 the uh, uh, visual aspect of it but underneath it there is a much bigger window that allows you to see all the different uh, tracks and stems that are making up the song so uh, Chandler are you excited about this or what, what do you think about Spice? I, I played with the player this morning. Uh, you know, they had that sample track with all, yeah. I think it was 35 tracks, sample song with 35 tracks. Uh, I was blown away. You know, I was, I was, although it's revolving around DJs and electronic music now, I was just imagining it's like a, a band that you had 10 years ago where everyone lives in different cities and this, you know, just making it easier to collaborate or right. finish stuff in, in a in a cloud-based way you can do that now with dropbox and and sending files around but it's it's clumsy yeah this is this is you know it's like why didn't garage band think of this this is something apple uh, you know apple could could have Absolutely. created a bunch of i mean uh, people are complaining about too much music you know as it is because everyone can make music but uh I, I was I sat there this morning, you know, very early this morning with my jaw just hit the floor when I'm like, wow. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. It's cool. <laughs> I, 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 when I, they explained to me what they were trying to do with the player, I was like, wow, this is going to be in awesome if, if it works and it does work it looks like so yeah. it's going to be a case of how easy it is for people to publish uh, this stuff uh, right because uh, uh, the, the one they showed of course was a demo uh, of, of the technology and it, uh, i'm really interested to see how the publishing process is going to work on the front uh, but uh, yeah they also raised 4.5 million dollars so on a series mm -hmm. a round so they're going to keep going for a, for for a while longer and uh, hopefully they're going to get a bunch of users because i think you know the tech seems really good they also do a backup service essentially for for what you for your projects and so it seems to make a lot of sense for 
for musicians that do a lot of music on the go and might be traveling from place to place and collaborating with different people. Uh, Gemma, do you feel like this could be, uh, you know, yet another uh, way for people to be able to collaborate long distance and, and create some interesting stuff out of it? Out of it? Totally. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, that there's been a need for something like this for quite some time. That You've got an awful lot of, kind of producers who are, are musicians who are working on their own, maybe, that they've got a guitar, they're really, really good in guitar, they're looking for a string section or whatever. I can see this service moving is that kind of area that you kind of you basically kind of like say I, I need a string service you maybe will be based in Dublin Ireland and you, you could find a string player in New York who play with you and collaborate on the track however as Chandler pointed out look it will be or, or, I think Chandler pointed out just the publishing on this will be interesting it's like I mean how's that how's that going to work out say these people start collaborating on a track and it becomes a massive massive hit you know and like you know we all know where's a hit there's a writ so it's like yeah. where's, what, what's, the, what's the publishing side in this where, where's that going to go but I think as an actual tool I was looking at it, I was looking at it yesterday and I was just kind of going like okay I'm not a musician but like this solves that kind of problem that if you're a bedroom if you're a bedroom producer and you want to, and you're a bit of a, you, a lot of musicians we, as we know are quite introverted and they're they're very antisocial and they're not exactly great with people unfortunately like if they want to find some people this is an ideal way of doing it but like you know again it would be interesting to see that when the, if the problems occur how they will be addressed yeah and, and uh, the, the cool thing to point out as well that if, if, I, if I understand things correctly and sort of I, I given this go it, it's essentially more like a, a Google Docs technology in, in a sense because you can actually collaborate on a track uh, at the same time and the changes get saved in the cloud automatically and so that's the interesting thing about it it's, it's not like you know you have to download the entire project and then mm. uh, work on it and then re-upload it it's like the, the changes are being constantly updated a bit if you, a bit like if you had a, a google word document uh, or, or something that you were working on uh, uh, online directly and so that that i think that's that's also a very exciting thing about it that it it, it just eliminates a lot of uh, back and forth uh, between uh, co collaborators that happens all the time and so yeah. uh, very very cool stuff and uh, uh, you know again uh, companies e e eking out you know sort of the, their own space creating their own space uh, uh, and, and providing features that uh, uh, bigger companies like for example Ableton haven't been able to uh, come up with uh, themselves so we'll see we'll see what, what happens there and how how much uh, paid how many paid users they can actually uh, garner through this because of course that's a big draw of the company and uh, uh, I think we should move on to talking about uh, uh, UK internships so that that's a bit of a, a niche thing that I, I wanted to cover but essentially uh, there's a lottery scheme uh, called the big music project uh, this was covered by CMU uh, last week uh, and uh, um, the UK lottery essentially funds a bunch of projects and the big music project is one of them and now uh, UK music companies are being encouraged to offer paid internships uh, uh, to uh, young people considering a career in the industry and uh, and and this big music project uh, uh, might actually uh, just uh, be able to help you if you have a company in the UK to cover up to 50% of an interns wages uh, uh, on internships between uh, 3 and 12 months uh, uh, so this is a, is a project that uh, was uh, uh, announced following the, the crackdown on unpaid internships which of course is a very uh, bad thing that happens in our industry all the time in, in, in the sense that it's people working for months and months full time uh, without uh, seeing a, a penny essentially and uh, uh, you know uh, Jeff Ralston was quoted as saying you know Tal talented inter interns provide an injection of new blood bright ideas and fresh thinking into growing business through the big music project we're giving a helping hand uh, to music companies across the UK to fulfill their potential and to invest in the future of the uh, industry and, and that's from the uh, uh, co-organizer of Big, big Music Project and the head of the BPI uh, Jeff Taylor uh, you know but Chandler did, do, do you wish you, you saw more stuff like this in the US is there any stuff like this happening and uh, and how are people dealing with the whole intern uh, issue over there well, I wish I saw it, and I, w I wished it was global, or I wish the U.S. had the same thing. I know it's, we see uh, Canadian bands getting grants from the government. We yeah. see you know U.K. lottery funding music business internships. In the U.S., it's just like you're on your own. Uh, <laughs> but the, I think that the biggest struggle for small uh, small firms, even even firms as big as Windish Agency, right. you know, they they can't afford to pay an intern. Uh, the arguments on some some side is that the intern's not providing enough value to pay, uh, and or they're getting credit. The, the way they they get by in the U.S. is yeah. it, you're getting credit for it. It's uh, what do they call that? Uh, I can't remember. But uh, it's just you're getting college credit. So that also sort of screws the people who are 23 and graduated from college. We have students that that have bachelor's degrees and then come and get a certificate at Berkeley online, and they're like maybe they work in a day job and they're like, I'd love to get in the industry. Is there an internship program? And 
companies won't hire someone who's 24 years old in into a position and you know some of the we're, you know the sad thing is the music is based in New York and LA yeah. Miami Nashville's not that expensive but all those cities are hugely expensive to to live uh, but this would be wonderful so you know if <laughs> I get. I have students all over the world, so when next time I have a UK student, I'm going to make sure that they're aware of this because yeah. we get asked all the time, "Can you help me get an internship?" And I said, I, "I don't know of any available that aren't unpaid, and you know, unpaid ones. You have to. It has to be a really valuable learning lesson yeah. with it, with somebody reputable. You know, it's like I know Emily White from Whitesmith. She does internships, and I imagine that you you come out of there." Uh, with just tons of knowledge, so that that may be worth it. But I've heard other horror stories where interns were just basically glorified gophers. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I mean, and there, you know, you, you made a good point there. You know, for any listeners, uh, I know there's a lot of students from around the UK that listen to the show. Uh, so if you are a, a student and you uh, have seen a company that's perhaps a small, medium sized that, that works in music, and you would like to intern with them, uh, you know, try and get in touch with them. You know, they, it might be that they're not offering an internship today because they don't have the funds to cover it. Uh, if you do point out that this scheme exists, uh, and yeah. they may actually be able to apply, and actually you can create an opportunity for yourself there. <laughs> so, and yeah. <laughs> I think. Uh, resourcefulness is definitely the number one uh, uh, thing in, in this industry, uh, especially today. Uh, Jamie, is, uh, what's the situation in Ireland? Of course, you have some, uh, it's an opportunity to talk about uh, how working class heroes, which is a great event that showcases uh, new artists I in Ireland. But as far as the business side of things is concerned, uh, is there any help to, to get things going for, for a business starting out uh, or for interns that want to learn about the industry? Not really. I mean, do you, do you think we have is a thing called uh, uh, JobBridge? And JobBridge is, is kind of like, why is this a top of payment for those? who are on unemployment benefit or unemployment assistance once they go a job. Unpaid in internships will just rule, rule the roost. I mean, they're everywhere. And, and like as Chandler said, they are very unfair. I mean, I, I, it, it, I, was, thinking, I was talking about this in Derry at, uh, at the weekend at Coach Tech. And like, I'm just thinking, if I was starting out now, you know, I could like, you know, I couldn't afford to do this. I, like, I mean, I, like, I, it's not like I had rich parents or anything like that. I actually couldn't afford to do these unpaid, unpaid inter internships. And it just seems to me that it's just become this incessant, uh, like, in, in, like, totally part of the part of the mix now that when you finish college when you finish school that rather than getting a job it's like you're on this intern program it's cheap labor for employers when it comes to music industry we've been music industry has been has, has always been we know this it's always been the home of low wages you know it really has I mean like when you start off you know it, it, it's funny I, I, I remember working as a press officer in a major label in the late 1990s I met someone recently who's got a much similar job and the pay hasn't changed that much you know and that's 15 mm -hmm. years ago you know so it's like I mean music industry is, isn't somewhere where you're going to go and make lots of money at the very, very start. Maybe if you turn to a Jimmy Iovine or, or, or whoever and you move up the ladder, then that's what the money is. But like in terms of start off, it's not it's not great. And it, it, it's very hard. It's all very good for someone like me to kind of say, like, okay, you, you've got to stand up for yourself. You've got to like me make sure you get paid for your work. But it's totally a different matter if you're someone aged between 18 and 22 looking for your first step on the ladder in the music industry. It's very hard to say no when someone's coming at you kind of going, come on, work for me can't pay your bills with experience, but unfortunately exactly. there's no other solution right now. You know? And so when I hear about when I hear about schemes coming in like the one you just described down here, it's brilliant. It's absolutely great. It's what's needed. It need, it needs to be not just sectoral, it needs so, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a very good scheme to have and uh, excited to see it uh, uh, take shape and hopefully we'll see some, some good companies uh, be able to take advantage of it as well. Uh, finally, Jim, uh, you had a couple of interesting articles. I'll give you a choice of two uh, that you published uh, uh, that if you wanted to discuss them. So the, the first one was about uh, blurring uh, of the lines between bands and brands and the second one was about uh, the sort of the, 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 the uh, arc of development of, of Hoosier and the power of a song uh, development. So uh, which one of the two do you, you feel more, more in invested in that you want to have a chat about? Um, let, let's, let's take the bands and brands one because I mean I think that's that's kind of like that's 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 very interesting. I, I suppose in terms of like, like it can be applied worldwide. You know, it's interesting to see so many brands move into this kind of space now. But it's also you got to look at how they're doing it. You know, and yeah. like it's not, like every brand like look who wants to get into the music space looks at the Red Bull Music Academy and say we want to be the Red Bull Music Academy. Yeah. They, they never yeah. will be because they don't look at how the Red Bull Music Academy has worked. I, I, I remember being, a, being like knowing about how that thing was kicking off in the late 1990s and just watching it grow. And it was slow and gradual and patient. Always patient. It was an amazing thing because it'd be 10 years into it, you're trying to kind of, you, you suddenly realize, hang on a second, Hudson Mohawk would come through here. Flying Lotus came through here. All these amazing electronic music producers came through this academy. Yeah. But 
The academy was not publicizing this. It was incredible. It was a slow, steady, credible approach. And they've got integrity, they've got a great reputation, and they do things properly. I mean, they, their, their operation in New York last year was, was, was something else. I mean, they, 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 didn't, they didn't hold back. It was a great operation. But like most brands want to invest space, and they just want they don't do it in, in a clever way. They just want to come in, come in, have their banner everywhere, have their name all over, and don't realize that's wrong. And from the band's point of view as well, the bands will just take the money, because I mean, the band, a bit like Bono, just want to get paid. You know, there are some there are some people moving into space that's interesting. Converse, what Converse has done with that studio in Brooklyn and in Boston, yeah. like that's really interesting. That's a very good move. Then you've got in London, you've got the the, uh, the House of Vans uh, venue, and you've also got that Jack Daniels thing up in Kings and Monarch, is it in uh, Camden? So yeah. you've got you've got, got that going out the one. So there are brands learning. What, what needs to be done is that there needs to be brand like I me. Mean, there's probably a lot of enthusiastic brand, brand managers out there, and they just need to be kind of given their head a little bit. They need to be kind of like told, okay you can actually go along and do this properly. You can take your time and do it really, really well because it benefits everyone in the end. I mean, like, you I mean, Red Bull are now, you know, they're synonymous with music because of the academy. But it's interesting. It's very interesting, though, in kind of in terms of money spent, you know, like you, all, all of us here would probably think, my God, Red Bull are spending an awful lot on, on stuff. I remember last year talking to one of the Red Bull honchos in New York and he just said, we spend as much money on one Formula One practice round as we're spinning on the entire Red Bull New York experience. I mean, to them, <laughs> it, it, again, it's again, it's a bit like Apple and their stack of cash. You know, right. it's just. It's a spit in the ocean, spit a hundred million dollars on the U2 campaign. So I mean, that, that's where Red Bull's head is at, you know. So I like it. it, it, it it's, it's a very interesting thing, and I, I, I think over the next kind of twelve to eighteen months, we are going to see a lot more savvy brands kind of like I mean, d- d- decide. Okay, we have to take a long term approach. I mean, I think I had a conversation a couple weeks ago with a, with a brand here in Ireland, and like you know, they were definitely talking the talk. They were like you know, they were they were looking at kind of like a look. They were talking a three to five year plan, which I thought was quite interesting. I'd never heard a brand talk like talk in that kind of way before so maybe it is finally getting through to brand managers and their account executives that you do need to be patient it all can't happen overnight Absolutely, the long-term involvement I think is is key. And uh, uh, the interesting thing that I actually I didn't know about uh, Red Bull Music uh, Red Bull Music Academy until I went to Cologne's see of Pop is the fact that uh, the whole thing was kickstarted by uh, 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 an agency. Essentially, the Red Bull went to an agency called Yara Star uh, in Germany, uh, and uh, uh, they said, "Look, this is some, something we want to work in," and and they came up with the whole concept and and sort of are still uh, helping Red Bull run it. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a there was a keynote by Torten, Torsten uh, Schmidt. Torsten, uh, yeah, yeah, and. and that was super interesting. I didn't know anything about it. I just thought it was an internal Red Bull project up until then. Yeah, so. the, the, the Tor- Torsten and Manu, uh, like the people who've been behind since day one from the Red Bull side, I mean, they are huge music fans, but they're also like I me. Mean, they're very, very good, very strong characters, and they know what, they know what they want, you know, and it, you, you need people like that involved in the project who will basically like I me mean, deflect any sort of like criticism. I'm sure there's been times when Red Bull are kind of going, why exactly are we setting up a studio in Cape Town? Why are we doing this in <laughs> Seattle? You know what I mean? What exactly is going on here? And like, so in fairness, you know, the results, you know, I, I mentioned Flying Lotus and Hudson Moore up there. They're not household names, you know. So, but like me, holding by the Academy was never going after household names. It's going after people who are making adventurous music. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chandler, uh, would you like to see a, a Red Bull uh, housing, uh, a Red Bull experience in Chicago? And, uh, and how do you feel about this whole space? Are you seeing some interesting stuff happening your, your end? Yeah, I, I think the thing that I notice about it is the difference between thinking of it as advertising or sponsorship versus partnership. And it, the key is in Red Bull's case, it was partnership, it was long-term, it was music fans. I mean, essentially, if you've got a, a ton of money and somebody comes to you and says, let's do this and let's, let's do this in perpetuity forever, let's, you know, then, then it's different than Pepsi or Doritos. <laughs> if you've been, to, you, you've been to South by Southwest and yeah. seen the Dorito, Doritos <laughs> stage, yeah. Yeah, that's, we were both there. That's, that's not subtle and that's, you know, you, you probably remember a time when concerts had a lot less branding around them. Uh, but, you know, I noticed with like Converse, I, I think, isn't the agency or the, the company that helps Converse with their music related stuff um, called Cornerstone or something? There's oh, the, right. the people, the people behind that are music. You know, the reason it works so well, similar to Red Bull, is that the similar people, it's, it's music people. Yeah. You got to hope. The, the hope is that Apple, with the infusion of people like Ian Rogers, may, you know, veer from sponsorship and, and, and advertising to more music supporting, because that's what Red Bull is. I, mean, I would love to see it. I would love, 
you know, if Red Bull opened venues in, yeah. in, in Chicago or, you know, if bought the House of Blues and rebranded it, it would probably be a good thing. I mean, they've proven it. It's your Jim's article was was great as I was reading it. I'm just like, that's the difference. It's not that they're just subtle. It's that they're honest. They're they're authentic. Yeah. And that's that's the thing. It's not it doesn't. I don't drink Red Bull a lot, but I'll, you know, you see that people drive around. We have Cooper Minis that are re- retrofitted as Red Bull, and you see someone giving away Red Bulls, you'll take one because, yeah. you know, it's a positive brand. You think of it as in a positive light. It's, it's an ed- energy drink that's giving back to the music. And of course, it helps if you have like you know uh, essentially bottomless you know <laughs> bottomless funds yeah. to, to draw yeah. from uh, to do they're this. They're doing and... well. Yeah, I mean <laughs> so... they're they're giving the music industry wings. You know the the artists wings <laughs> in, in multiple ways. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean I I remember Topspin was involved. Uh, Stage Block, you know, was even involved in Red Bull's right. label for a while. So it they're just they're, you know for the last five years that they. They've really, I guess, you know, got to the point where their bands are making them some money and getting some fame. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, it's becoming a, a yeah, like Torsten was saying in, in the keynote in Cologne, it, it 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 has become something they can now measure. Whilst for a long time it was something that they couldn't measure, and they just have to trust that yeah, we're doing the right. right thing. And now they're actually starting to get metrics. And so, like he was talking about stuff like uh, what was it? Uh, he was talking about some of the uh, what happened um, in New York and and the the press mentions of of Red Bull and of the Academy there were you know ton of press mentions even like seven right. or, seven or eight mentions in the New York Times yeah. Uh, yeah. and they never had a mention in the New York Times before so for them it was it was definitely a win you could you couldn't ignore it in New York they were absolutely everywhere I mean huge subway ads I mean they own New York and what's really interesting is that like you know the, I suppose uh, as a cynical hack you kind of go okay how how are the New York media I suppose the most savvy smart media in the world are they going to be cynical about this they didn't they just kind of like they drank the Kool-Aid they drank the Red Bull you know they they, <laughs> they were they were all over it you know I, I, I thought that to be quite interesting and like you know, they were all over because again as Chandler just said they could actually see it was working you know what I mean they could actually see that this was something that was like yeah this is this is really 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 interesting and Cornerstone they're they're an amazing agency you know they were they yeah. were involved with kind of a lot of the SD sound system uh James Murphy's hookup with Nike back in the day as well and like you know they're 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 they're, they're a wise and savvy group yeah yeah and uh, yeah at this point I'm actually thirsty so I think we should draw the show to a close but uh, <laughs> Uh, but I might go and have a nice tea. I don't think I have a Red Bull in the house. Um, and, uh, you know, guys, it was such a pleasure having you on once again. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, for a gym, again, it's on the record. Uh, the links are in the show notes uh, and uh, you'll find them there. It's a great blog. If you have an RSS reader, I suggest you subscribe. And also uh, the banter sessions are available as a podcast as well, right? Yeah, they're available now as a podcast. We've, we've done about 26 of them as podcast. If you go to thisisbanter.com forward slash podcast, you'll get them there. Awesome. So this thisisbanter.com forward slash podcast and uh, thoroughly recommended. I, I was uh, uh, absolutely captivated by some of the interviews we did at the uh, Hardworking Class Heroes uh, sessions uh, last year. So. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, and uh, Chandler, for you, it's uh, musicgeekservices.com and anything else you want to plug? Um, yeah, I've just started a, a newsletter. I was sort of inspired by Darren's Daily Digest, and I have former students who wanted to stay in touch, and it's actually grown beyond that. It's called The Coil Report. Awesome. Uh, so it's uh, thecoilreport.com or just coilreport.com. You can sign up. I, it started out as daily, and it's now I'm transitioning it to weekly, although yeah. half my subscribers like to hear, me, hear from me every day. And it's just basically music marketing tips uh yeah. mostly for the direct to fan you know diy type artists so artist focused awesome that's fantastic and so uh, yeah go so i haven't actually subscribed myself yet so i need, I need to go on there and Please subscribe do. and subscribe too and uh, uh well that it was a pleasure having you on uh, once again uh, thanks so much for listening to the show again next week uh, it's, it's going to be a pre-recorded show but an unmissable one uh, we are going to look at some of the uh, some fantastic uh, uh, tips and, and some some uh, great insight around uh, uh, designing music products uh, and uh, uh, with two great uh, designers and so it's going to be a it's, it's a really fun show actually already recorded it so i can say that already and uh, <laughs> and it's very visual so uh, i would recommend you actually watch the show rather than listen to it if you can or you go back to the video because we're actually showing some of the examples on the video itself uh, uh, while we go through them and uh, the week after is, is not going to be a show and so we're going to resume on the 16th uh, probably the next show is going to be live around the 16th of uh, uh, october uh, thanks so much for listening again it's digital music trends 